Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Love Fruit Podcast, a podcast for raw vegans and fruitarians. And if you'd like to follow us a little bit more closely, you can go to fruitfest.co.uk to join our newsletter. Today, we are one of our one of my passions, anyway, with the Love Fruit Podcast is trying to get the stories of long-term raw vegans and raw foodists, people that have done this diet a long <clears throat> a long time, because they've often got a lot of wisdom to share with us, a lot of great stories, and they, they show people that you can really thrive on a, a, a raw living foods lifestyle long-term. So today I'm really happy to be joined by Chef Ocean, and Ocean has been following 100% living foods lifestyle since 1996, and he developed many recipes working at several raw food restaurants in California and Oregon. He's uh, shared his food at the Burning Man Festival, Raw Spirit Festival, and West Coast Festivals over the past 15 years. He was originally inspired to eat exclusively raw foods by the famous book, Survival into the 21st Century by Victoris Kalvinskis. And um, he believes that a raw food lifestyle is a key point in helping us uh, reach our greatest potential. He's the author of a book called Living Foods for Everyone. His website is rawvegan.love, which I believe is also his Instagram. And uh, he's also a runner, a rock climber, a martial artist. So he's got that athletic side as well. So I'm really looking forward to find out more about you, Ocean. Is there anything else you'd like to share with the listeners before we move on? I think you hit the high points. Uh, yeah, I mean, the the raw food lifestyle or the living foods lifestyle uh, wasn't very popular when I first started. So I'd like to share as much as I can, you know, tips and, and tricks and what I've learned along my journey. But uh, yeah, when I first started, it was, you got a bowl of almonds and a spoon and that was pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you this. Were you brought up in, uh, as a, as a, and on any kind of alternative lifestyle or were you pretty much the standard American diet growing up or what, what, what did it look like growing up for you? Yeah, growing up, it was about as standard American diet as it could get. Um, I was growing up in Ohio and uh, the Midwest. Um, the community I lived in was mostly Polish and Italian near Cleveland, mm-hmm. Ohio. So um, anything went. I mean, it was uh, very, very heavily meat based. Uh, my parents uh, would often get uh, this truck delivery from a frozen foods company where it was just really elaborate, heavy cheese laden fried food. Uh, we always, you know, we we had uh, seafood and uh, steak uh, all the time and uh, chicken was a really popular one. But there was always meat on the table, sometimes even two or even three meats uh, in the same meal. Uh, lots of processed food, lots of canned food. Uh, yeah, so the alternative lifestyle just really didn't exist or was considered like a crazy, you know, odd thing back when I was growing up. Mm-hmm. And what was, what was, what kind of started to get you to maybe question the diet you were eating and start to make some changes? Uh, that's, well, I had a number of influences. I'd say the, it first dawned on me when I went to a Grateful Dead concert and there was a f- pure moment there where I, I didn't was so overwhelmed with all I, I don't even think I made it into the concert I was just in the parking lot that was you know really <laughs> famous thing to do was not even buy a ticket and just walk around and and I uh you know I was drinking beer and you know just participating in everything I, I could get around me but not in a, a healthy way and and then I walked past this guy who had a little propane stove on the ground and uh, he was making grilled cheese sandwiches and selling them for a dollar mm-hmm. and I, I'd never seen a grilled cheese sandwich like this. He was putting like cucumbers and mushrooms and tomatoes inside it. And just this gourmet, you know, but a guy with a big long beard, just doing it right on the ground, right on the back of his car. And uh, it was one of the most fantastic things I'd ever, I'd ever eaten. And it was, I guess it was just the moment that I was in, but he told me that he'd been vegetarian for a long time and that that's what he did. And when he traveled, you know, it was much easier to be vegetarian and so I took that with me. It was just kind of this little moment where I thought, wow, that was, a, that was one of the best meals I've ever had. It didn't involve meat. And so I took that home and picked up a book called Diet for the Small Planet. I found it at a local bookstore in uh, Coventry, Ohio, which was this somewhat alternative area. And there was a little vegetarian restaurant there, uh, actually a couple of them. One was called Tommy's. And um, I just started experimenting with what would happen if I stopped eating pork, you know, and I did it, thought, well, you know, Muslims don't eat pork. So let me try, you know, there's a whole, you know, group of people in India that don't eat meat. 
uh, slowly evolved that to um, meeting up with a group of people that I'd met at a Grateful Dead concert and visited them in Missouri uh, just to, you know, go have a vacation. And um, there was that defining moment when they, they said, well, we don't serve meat here. And I thought, well, what am I going to do? Uh, you know, because I still eat a little bit of fish here and there. And they said, here's, here's what we want you to do is go to the end of the street and there's a chicken rendering plant. And we want you to just go down there and just take a look and come back and let us know what you think. So I did that. And I saw this site that I've never seen before in my life because I'd always gone to the grocery store and pick up packaged food and wrapped in plastic or, uh, or whatever. But I saw hundreds and hundreds of chickens just hanging upside down, their heads cut off, bleeding out in a giant field, hanging on meat hooks. And just, it went on for probably about a half mile out and then a half mile in. That was their, their killing field, their bleeding field. So, um, and I watched it for about half an hour and realized, you know, that never stops. It just goes on and it, they never turn it off. It's just 24 seven, just, and I thought that's, that's not right. That, that doesn't make sense to me because here's what I'm buying into is, is what I just witnessed is the screams and the, and you know, all the, the, I mean, just the parade of death. It, mm. And that really hit home for me. I'd never eaten meat since then. Wow. Sorry. Where was that you were at? Where were you living uh, at that point? Uh, I was living in Ohio and I went to visit my friends in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, right, I and, see. Sorry. and again, that wasn't really an alternative lifestyle area, but it was just a small group of people that I met through the Grateful Dead concert um, that, you know, tra vegetarian lifestyle is extremely conducive to traveling. Uh, you know, if you can't, especially if you don't have a lot of money. So for some sure. people that I met did it for financial reasons, other did it for ethical reasons. But for me, it was uh, the, what really hit home was, wow, this, I love animals, but uh, why am I, why am I supporting this? Why am I doing this? And then, you know, that, that just, and what it was off of, the table ever since then. What kind of age was that? What, what age were you then? Uh, I was about 24 and I'd met some vegans and, you know, some of the most beautiful people I'd ever met in my life uh, were also at rainbow gatherings, which I was heavily involved in. It kind of went hand in hand with the Grateful Dead uh, touring lifestyle. It's a really good excuse to go see, um, you know, the world and go see, you know, I went to Montana and, and go see the woods and the forest and, those uh, rainbow gatherings are just gatherings. I mean, they're just yeah. happening. There's yeah. no organization. And uh, generally they're vegan uh, because it's very hard to keep meat or cheese uh, without people getting sick at those sure. large gatherings, refrigeration or, or uh, you know, electricity. So it was more of a health concern at those. And some of these people that I met, especially younger people, uh, you know, younger than me, had been living for months and sometimes they would just eat an orange and it, this blew me away I was, I was thinking wow i really need to rethink my approach to food because i'm so disconnected from my food that you know to see people um making food in a big pot on a fire I, i've never seen that before you know just that connection it was always from a restaurant or from a grocery store um and that that uh you know that experience um led me to then pick up a book called Survival of the 21st Century by Viktor Kovinskis, which I think you mentioned earlier. That coupled with the fact that my lifestyle up to that point, even though I'd become vegan, or well, I was actually vegetarian and didn't become vegan until around the age of, uh, I'd say 26 or 27, um, I still had massive acne problems. And mm -hmm. I, I didn't like, it. I didn't like how my skin looked and I didn't like having to take the medicine. There were some side effects. I couldn't really go out in the sun that much because I was taking Retin-A and um, tetracycline. You know, I had cystic acne. I was actually in a medical book for having um, a certain type of acne on my back that had resulted from scar tissue. So they took pictures of me, but, you know, I never really found a solution to it. Actually, one doctor, I'm sorry, he was an older doctor who said you should start drinking skim milk. <laughs> but he was the only one that connected acne or skin issues or rosacea with diet. Mm -hmm. So... I, I stumbled upon a website at the same time I was exploring Victoris's book called freeacnebook.com. Um, and it's not a, it's not a vegan diet that they advocated, but it was a heavy fruit diet. Mm -hmm. And it basically said, eat two pounds of fruit a day, uh, eat um, <clears throat> some form of protein, enough protein. And they had recommended raw fish, but I, I substituted sprouts for that, cause, you know, cause I was into Ann Wigmore's, you know, teachings and things like that at the time. I thought I could just get the, get it from sprouts. And Diet for a Small Planet, of course, taught me that I could do that food combining with beans and things. Uh, so I tried the diet, very strict, no spices, no salts, uh, mostly fruit. And my acne had went away within two weeks. And that's all the, the website said is just try it for two weeks, see what happens. And um, it, it was it was a really interesting transformation because I, uh, <clears throat> my, I was living with my brother at the time and he just thought, what are you doing? 
you know, why, why you just eating bananas and apples? And, and so I, I wrote myself up a little recipe book that had, you know, uh, the raw vegan chili in it and a couple other things, raw vegan hummus, but mostly, you know, I was exploring the non-sweet fruits like zucchini and tomato, avocado, cucumber, uh, you know, bell peppers and things like that. And um, I, I was really onto something at that point. And so that's what really drove it home with the raw lifestyle was to say, if I keep cooking my food and, you know, freeacnebook.com, that was, it's, it's like, he wasn't selling anything. He, it was uh, just written from the perspective of a fictitious person who is a model, mm -hmm. a Japanese model. And she, uh, it was, it turned out to be a gentleman, I believe from Scandinavia, who was kind of assuming this, you know, he thought the message would go across better <laughs> rather than, you know, some guy from Scandinavia, this Japanese model writing uh, the book, but it talked specifically about the molecular aspects of what happens when you cook food, the caramelization process and how that damaged protein will then affect your lymph system. The lymph system then dries out your skin. Your skin becomes real tight and starts storing water. And that's what clogs the pores. Mm. Uh, it turn, turned out to be a hundred percent true. I, I, you know, anytime I accidentally get toasted sunflower seeds, like, you know, I interview, you know, if I go to a restaurant, I'll be like, Hey, are you sure you're not toasting your sunflower seeds? But even if I get them, uh, uh, pasteurized, I'll tell, I can tell because I'll get a little bit of uh, skin issues uh, from it and it pops up right away. It all directly relates to what I learned on that website, which is to say that damaged yeah. proteins is almost one of the worst things we can do to our body. Amazing, amazing. Uh, I've, got, I've got so many questions to ask from all this. It's so fascinating. <laughs> um, I, I, love, I love the idea that you, you kind of got into this alternative scene through the Grateful Dead concerts and stuff like that. And the, I've heard a Rainbow Guy has never been to one, but there's some in Europe as well. I've never... I've never been along, but I, I did actually hear that they were vegan and often a lot of raw food was there um, because, mm -hmm. as you're saying, because it's kind of simpler, I suppose. Um, I, uh, so this book, Survival into the 21st Century, I've never mm -hmm. actually read that. I know it's like a classic book. It was a, it was a big book in the 70s, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, what was it about that book that, that kind of inspired you? Oh, wow. Uh, so at the time I was reading uh, another book called Be Here Now uh, by Ram Das, and uh, there's a couple other books related to it. Uh, Bhagavan Das uh, wrote a book called It's Here Now or You. For sure. I know, I know those books, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah fantastic. Yeah. And it's what I tell you about the survival in the 21st century was the rawness of the book. I mean, I've never seen someone write with such exposure and vulnerability and honesty. And I spoke with Victoris Kovinskis a couple of times, met him at a festival. I mean, you can gaze in this guy's eyes for days because his eyes look like like uh, blue fish bowls. I mean, it's amazing, you know, the transformation that he's put himself through. The drawings in the book are just so real. And what and, you know, he cobbled it together. It looks like he used different font sizes and it was long before word processors. It was a it was a book that just reflected love and love for the planet, love for his own spirituality, love for um uh, you know, animals, everything. And what really shown inside that book was the fact that you could get high on purity. And I think that's what his, the message that I got from it was that, uh, you know, at the time I was smoking marijuana, I was, you know, taking mushrooms, things like that. Those are all, I mean, great spiritual journeys, but they're not sustainable. And that coupled with the fact that I saw an interview with George Harrison, and I believe it's on the Dick Cavett show, like a recording of it where George Harrison, you know, famous for doing hallucinatory uh, and psychedelic explorations and having that reflected in his music and his lifestyle said, well, being sober is probably the highest trip you can go on. And that's what really led me to, to just take that book. I, I took a two week vacation. I went out to Nederland, Colorado, one of the most beautiful places I've ever been just west of Boulder up in the, the Rocky mountains, rented a, a room, didn't tell anybody, you know, I was there or anything and just, fasted and did uh, cleanses, um, did, you know, standard enemas, went to do a colonic, took hikes in the woods and just wanted to be, be so much like Victorious. And then uh, just watching myself go through that transformation, it was like <clears throat> my body was singing for some reason. I don't know how else to describe it. It was like the organs were actually finally working together wow. and something was gelling and I was doing hikes and I, I didn't eat for two weeks and didn't even notice. And I lost, you know, few pounds and it was all it, it was all this transformational experience and I thought this is this is really where it's at is this is sustainable is the idea that if you can pu get pure and stay pure your body ha gives you so much feedback from that that you it's far better than smoking you know 
weed or I mean, those are good things to do temporarily every once in a while to kind of open you up. But that's, you know, if you really want to stay there, that's the way to go. And that's what I learned from his book. So the part of your motivation for going raw, which is kind of interesting, is part of it was the acne, which was part of it, health, a bit of a health issue. But it, it seems like you were on a bit of a spiritual quest. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, I grew up Catholic. Uh, I, you know, was very into Christianity for a long time. And, you know, Bhagavan Das talks about that in his book. You know, it's, it's definitely his journey from one uh, religion to another. And what I settled on was an unusual type of religion. Um, I, I'm not sure if you even call it religion, but I, I would describe myself more as a Taoist. And I started studying a martial art called Hapkido, have a, a, a second degree black belt in Hapkido and a first degree black belt in Taekwondo. What I learned from my instructor is the end of that word Tao, D-O, is actually a, means it's a Taoist art. And the, the gist of that was that action is, in, is part of the journey, right? Is you can right. study religion or practice it, but really it, it, the journey that you're on and the actions that you take. And my instructor for martial arts was, he, he just laughed all the time. And he was the last person to tell you, about anything spiritual or anything like that. It was just, it was this underlying current in the practice that says, if you show up to class, if you do these movements, if you work with your group, if you're respectful with other people, uh, if you're, you show up in a good mood, if your nails trimmed and your, your uniform mm -hmm. really well, these are rituals that you go through to bring yourself up to a higher level of, of being like more of, wow. you know, how, how do I get along with people? How do I, and you know, those arts are considered like dangerous arts. You know, you learn how to break bones and things like that. But the, the focus of the art is to not only move like water, uh, to be yielding, to be powerful and yet non-confrontational, but also to bring confrontation down, right? Is when someone's being aggressive toward you, you, you simply show them how aggressive they're being toward you by holding them in a position where if they continue to be aggressive, it starts to hurt them. And that's what I learned from the raw foods is that the society in general is just aggressive toward their own bodies and they're aggressive toward animals. It's this aggressive form of eating mm. that uh, does damage all the time. I mean, the mucus layer uh, is a, is a form of protection that your own body creates against what you're putting in your mouth. Uh, and that, so that's really where it starts is self love and self purity is to say, why am I doing this to myself? And that uncovers a whole host of emotional and spiritual and, and mental uh, roadblocks that really you could latch onto. You can say, hey, if I do my yoga practice, if I eat, um, you know, more pure, then what's this cramp doing in my leg? What's this cramp all about? And as that cramp or, or you know, start to, to stretch with it, or you start to do a cleanse, that can bring up emotions. And that cramp becomes a man manifestation, a physical manifestation of uh, maybe a past trauma or a, or a belief that, you know, like no longer need to hold on to. So I came up with this idea that physical, emotional, and spiritual are all the same thing, right? We're emotional and spiritual beings and physical manifestations. And you can approach things with a therapist mentally. You can approach things by going to, uh, you know, your religious uh, rituals or, or doing praying. But you could also approach the whole being from a physical aspect and achieve the same results, right? It's kind of just what angle do you want to climb up the mountain, <laughs> right? You're going to get to the mountain no matter what. So I just chose the physical aspect of it, exercise, diet, um, you know, pure, pure living, pure water. And that just seemed to let everything else fall into place. And, and it, it helped me grow spiritually. Amazing. And I, I love the, 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 by the way, I wanted to say I'm also a martial arts myself. I do Aikido, oh. not, not Hapkido, but um, uh -huh. we, I, I find it so, so interesting. We've got quite a lot of similarities here. We're both raw foods, martial mm -hmm. arts, rock music, spirituality <laughs> stuff. It's really cool. I, I, I love all that stuff. Um, yeah, I think there's something interesting in the fact that you made a decision you were going to move towards this raw diet and you went to a different place because I think there's something really helpful about finding a new environment mm -hmm. and or trying to change your environment if you're going to make a change like uh, like a cleanse or like going raw did, did you have a kind of intuition about that or was it just oh that well that's um i guess it was more of a necessity because uh i wanted to feel like a new person and in order to right. do that i need to disconnect and have everything be unfamiliar. And, you know, maybe you're, you're familiar with this too, but the, the feeling of unfamiliarity can be very scary, but it can also force a transformation, right? And I guess a good example of that would be one of my favorite things to do is to go to another country 
uh, Germany, for instance, don't speak a word of German. And but I speak a little bit of French, speak English. And the first time I went to Germany, no one, you know, everyone wanted to speak English with me. But it, it's just the idea that I have no idea what's going on around me. How do I address this? Like, it's almost like being newborn and saying everything, if everything around me is new and there's nothing I can latch on to, how do I use that to, um, to bring myself back to a comfort level? And it's kind of like an accelerated growth feeling and being in an environment where um, it is more natural. Uh, one thing that I've realized about the environments that we put ourselves into all the time is uh, everything is hand-sized, right? Doorknobs are hand-sized, phones are hand-sized, our houses are hand-sized. We, you know, everything is our size, right? But if you go into the mountains, like I did for that, that first retreat that I did in Netherlands, the mountains are not human sized, right? <laughs> the, the rivers, the oceans, the beaches, they're not meant, they're meant for everything. They're so big. And to get lost in that environment can be very humbling and can, you know, help, help, at least it helped me kind of find my place, get some perspective about my places in the world. And I think anthropomorphism is not anthropomorphism, anthropomorphism, uh, what's, what's it mean when we're all thinking humans are the center of the universe whatever that yeah, was uh, yeah yeah it sounded like what you were saying there like anthrocentrism or something yes something anthrocentrism like yeah and to get away from anthrocentrism i think is really key because we think animals are for us right, right. and we think the forests are for us and they're not they're we're part of that ecosystem and to go to a tree and think how can i interact with this tree that leads into fruitarianism and that's uh one moment that i had when i was uh, actually i think i was I was trying salvia divinorum at the time. It was just something that Terrence McKenna had, I had read a book from Terrence McKenna and it sounded really fun. I had this moment with a tree where I looked, looked and just felt like I was part of that tree and time just stopped. And I saw this glowing energy in the tree. And what, I, I don't think the tree spoke to me. I'm not going to go that far, but I would say that I spoke to myself on behalf of that tree. And I thought, how can I interact with this tree? How can I be symbiotic with this tree. This tree isn't necessarily for me. And the answer is the trees try to communicate with us through fruit, right? As fruit is wow. their contact with us where they say, I'm going to reward you with something delicious that your body and your eyes totally recognize, you know, this bright, colorful fruit. Take, take the fruit, eat it, take the seed inside it, plant it for me, right? Wow. That, that relationship is so simple and so beautiful and it's not aggressive. It's symbiotic. And it gives us a, a reason to go into the forest, right? And that's what birds do is they eat berries and, and they, they go into the forest and they eat the berries. And I don't know, if, I'm sure you've seen like trees growing up on like on top of a mountain. You're like, how did the tree get up there? Well, a, a bird ate a berry or ate a seed sure. and pooped up on the mountain. And that's sure. how the tree got up there. It worked out really well for the tree, right? Right. So, so that relationship, I think, is what is, is really important. And that's why I think it, it cracked me open going to a new place and, and being overwhelmed and trying to latch onto something. I realized, wow, these trees are really here for us. You know, especially for, yeah. How did your, your experiences of that cleanse of going raw at first, what, what experiences did you have? You, you felt different in your body and, and so on. What, what, what happened in the maybe months or years after that? Did you continue to see changes and uh, an awakening for you or what was your experience? Yes. And it was scary. Uh, I tell you, it was, I think the mucus layer that we all carry around, uh, you know, it's level, level mucus is absolutely healthy and you got to have it, but that mucus can also hold mold and bacteria, you know, so it's often a good, you know, it's a good practice to, to renew that or keep that mucus to a minimum, you know, keep it flowing through the body. But that mucus is a physical barrier to vibrations. And so if you have less of a mucus layer, you know, you're absorbing more of your food or there's less mucus inside your, your sinuses, you're breathing more, you're smelling everything around you. Uh, it's, it's just like that matrix red pill, right? Is it, it's so overwhelming just how many things are going on around us that are aggressive and, and uh, against nature and against ourselves uh, that it's, it's, it makes, made me like sit down and think, do I really want to do this? Do I really want to be exposed to um, the fact that most of our culture are, is centered around meat and alcohol or every home is centered around a stove, right? I don't believe in that anymore. I don't have, I don't use my stove, but that's like a requirement in the U S to even rent a place is it has to have a working stove everywhere you go. People are, are destroying their food and making it harder for them to digest. Um, and how I cope with that is, uh, just, I mean, meditation was, was one thing, but I also sought out community. 
<laughs> and I think it's really, really important is don't do it alone. You have to go find other people who are at least on some aspect of the journey. If you make mistakes with other people together, that's beautiful. I mean, if, if I've had experiences where I've gone with, um, with someone, you know, a, a, you know, I've gone on a date or something and, and they want to eat raw, but then afterward they say, oh, they're really, really, you know, I'm really, really hungry. So then we go eat, you know, they go have something cooked and it's really tempting to want to sit with that person and, and participate in their ritual, but instead just being present, right, is being present with someone, especially my parents, for instance, they eat a lot of meat, um, just being present with them and finding some connection, but being an example, right, is when everyone else is eating steak, you know, you're eating something that you find delicious like a salad or or you know i make gourmet food or make i bring my own food make burgers or even just crack and open avocado and participate in the experience with them without judgment uh but still allowing you to be your authentic self while them allowing them to be their authentic self you may be on two different paths or even two you know parts of the same journey but making sure that you find some connection with people and then finding connection with people who are far more advanced in that journey too. And I think that's important, like the fruit festival that you host in the Woodstock fruit festival. And I, I went to the BC, the Canada fruit festival, rainbow gatherings to a certain extent, and, you know, just going to raw vegan restaurants is being around that vibration and being inspired by that. So I, I think that's what I learned from the rainbow gathering is if you just isolate yourself to a group of people that echo your own beliefs, it can be very, you know, there's really not, you can grow together, but you really need to expose yourself to all kinds of different beliefs and all kinds of different people, because that, that's your, just the journey of life, right? Is don't isolate yourself with the community. Um, and, you know, that, like I said, that can be pretty scary to open yourself up and, and say, well, how, how do I feel around someone who's eating steak? And just sit with that feeling and try to connect with them in a different way. Uh, if you're, you're a musician, you know that music is a universal connection. It doesn't matter what you eat. Right. Wow, and be yeah. able to just play music with someone, pick up a guitar or, or even clap your hands with someone you're communicating. Right. And that yeah. can be a real nice connection. So I think it's important also to let go of diet in terms of, you know, how do I choose my friends or how do I choose my partners and, and things and going more toward how can I connect with people and what other different ways are there to connect? And I think that's a really important thing for someone starting on this is, is to understand, to expand your circle, but don't, don't let the people that you love fall apart, you know, fall away. Right. That's, it's kind of yeah. kind of That's so amazing. And I, I think I, like I just what I, what I just feel talking to you is like you, <laughs> you understood the things that you had to do to pursue this lifestyle more, which was finding community, finding other people is so important. Like I, I always try to say that to people, even if you can just find a potluck in your own city or a restaurant you can go to, like get around other people that are saying this because it does have... <laughs> So I love the fact you were saying that um, and you talked about eating as a ritual. That's mm-hmm. really interesting. And it, it's, it's so interesting. Um, so let's, let's get to you had, had started off. You, you were talking about, I think it was Colorado. You were talking about, but where did you go and find this community and where, where did you find other raw, raw vegans, raw foodists? And where did, where did the journey go from there? Okay. Uh, well, let's see. There was a couple key facets to this journey. And the first was that I was, um, I was living in Pennsylvania at the time that I went raw. I was living with my brother. Uh, he did not like the fact that I was doing cleanses. Um, he just thought it was, you know, it, it just, it, it kind of put a, a barrier between us. He, it, uh, he was vegetarian, uh, poss- you know, turning vegan, but I, it was just very extreme. He saw me lose a lot of weight and was worried about me uh, during, you know, my first 40 day fast. So one day he just said, this is enough. I, I just, you know, this, I can't watch you waste away like this. You need, uh, you need to find your own place to live. And so instead what happened is I went and lived in the woods and it was a place called Frick Park. I wasn't supposed to do it, but I had a community garden uh, in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, this uh, at a, near um, Homewood uh, is the area that I, I was in. And so I just started sleeping next to, on the grass next to my, <laughs> next to my garden. Um, other people started to notice and they say, Hey, you can't really do that. You know, but I did it for most of the summer, uh, actually slept on a bed of mugwort, had these fantastic dreams. That's totally true about mugwort. Uh, so as winter came, it got colder and I was like, I don't, I love this. I feel so good. I get up, I sleep like four hours a night. I get up right away and run a couple miles. I, I hop on my bike, go to my software engineering job, take a shower there, wear a tie all day, 
come and at three o'clock, four o'clock in the afternoon, go up, do my stretches in a big field and tend to my garden and, you know, go jam with some of my friends, jam with music, make a kale salad and then make a juice and, you know, hang out with my girlfriend for a few hours. But it was always going back to that tent in the woods. And so I set up a tent in the middle of this park and I lived there all winter. And I honestly, I don't know how I did it, but it's, it's more like that frog in boiling water. If it gets one degree colder every day, you don't notice. And eventually there was in the middle of winter and my comfort level was probably around 12 degrees Fahrenheit. I wore a bunch of, you know, layers and, you know, it, it was just, you know, snow covered my tent all the time. I just dug myself out of the tent and there was a family of deer that lived by nearby and I felt a real good connection to them. But I, I did that from June to June and I was, it was just so freeing. I mean, that time of my life was amazing where I was living this double lifestyle I was living like a little hermit out in the woods, but still participating in society, still had a job, so I had a, you know, rode my bike everywhere and no one knew, you know? Wow. So I, I, I promised myself at the end of that winter, I'm going to move to Hawaii. I, I got to, you know, <laughs> this is too hard. <laughs> so my first stop was California. I lived out there for, um, I, I just planned to be there for a couple of weeks, but I lived with a friend of mine from Pennsylvania who just moved to, to Santa Monica. And uh, the first day I was out there, she said, hey, you know, wow, you look fantastic. You know, this is, you know, because I, been living outside it's so healthy uh she said there's a new restaurant in town uh but you want to go try it It was a raw vegan restaurant just opened up like a couple days ago and it was juliano's raw Mm -hmm. and i walked in the restaurant and i I, the first time in my life in pennsylvania like i said it was almonds and a spoon right that was kale salad and you know i had you know decent juices and things to, to go on but he presented at his restaurant like these tacos and burgers and falafel and uh just I mean, just, I can't even remember how, like how much I ate that day, but I walked out of there about $150 lighter and I thought I cannot sustain this. So, but I just wanted to try everything because it was just all these new flavors that I'd never had before. Um, not to say it was any better because I was still doing, you know, just eating raw, you know, basic food, you know, tomato, cucumber, avocado, just eating them whole. But I walked in the next day and I, I wouldn't leave until he gave me a job. And I said, I, I need to learn how to do this. And so he wasn't there. I actually got behind the counter and they said, okay, well, you know, you can work for the day here and just make a dressing or something. So I spent like a, about an hour making dressing. He walked in the next day and he's like, who's this guy? And why does he have a dressing on the menu? You, you know, new, new people, they, they peel dates. They don't make dressings here, you know? So I, so he asked me to, to, um, my test was, he said, make me something. And I, I said, well, I'm going to invent a drink. And I walked over and he had this little smoothie bar of and it had everything you could think of mac, macadamia nuts hemp hemp hearts uh you know actual vanilla beans which are extremely expensive uh black t- sesame tahini and so i made him something that I, I told him was called an orange giuliano and if if anybody on this podcast knows giuliano if you name something after him he's all about it right <laughs> I love the guy but if you i mean his restaurants you know was named after him every you know he's he's very much into promoting, you know, his brand, right? So I called, I told him, this is an orange Giuliano. I took black sesame tahini, some vanilla and some orange juice and whipped it up into this frothy thing that was just like an orange Julius from, you know, we had those in the Midwest all the time. He tasted it and he said, all right, you can stay here, but you got to make one of these for me every morning. (laughs) (laughs) So, so working at that restaurant, I started meeting more and more raw foodists, uh, fruitarians, um, and I moved into a raw food community, uh, actually fruitarian community uh, called Rawtopia, and it was based in Malibu. And oh, wow. uh, the center of that community, it's, it's no longer there, but the center of the community was uh, eat fruits, be naked, go on nature hikes, uh, you know, live, um, you know, we had no toilets. We would actually go, <laughs> go eat figs and then plant the figs in the backyard by digging a little hole. And that's where, we, that's how we planted figs is we ate the figs and then pooped them out. And that's, <laughs> and as far as I know, there's a big fig orchard <laughs> there now. Um, <laughs> and that experience, like, led me to, to think, you know, we would do um, hot springs and do, you know, naked hikes and things. You know, we went out in the forest, went down to Joshua Tree. Um, and that's just that exposure to nature and was, was my first experience. Um, and then the second experience was going to the Costa Rica World Rainbow Gathering uh, in 2004. Uh, there was the same idea that pe- we, many people just unannounced, unorganized, went into the jungle in Costa Rica uh, there was, you know, jungle, that's it. Monkeys, uh, you know, there was a Jesus lizard that was near my campsite and we just built a sustainable community for three months. And I, I started a raw food. Uh, it was, I called it the sprout kitchen. 
And so we had people bring in garbanzo beans and lentils and, uh, you know, go to the markets and pick fruit. And what I did is I opened up a fruit kitchen, which was 24 seven. We had knives and we had fruit. And that was it. Anytime you're hungry, come here and, you know, cut up some papaya. And, and there was always someone there eating or tending. And then the other kitchen that I started was more of a gourmet kitchen, like that Giuliano style kitchen. So after, you know, um, working at Giuliano's, I started working with uh, recipes that I could do without electricity. Uh, like we dried um, pizza crusts on potato sacks out in the sun. And we did, um, we had hand blenders. So we made hummus with a hand blender and we made uh, fruit soup with papayas and coconuts. And uh, so um, I fed about 1200 people, uh, a seven course gourmet meal in the middle of the jungle. And that was the what? center of my red food lifestyle. It was no electricity, just everyone wanted to participate. So we had about 40 people all doing various tasks, chopping. And uh, the, the menu was like burgers that we dehydrated, that we ground up lentils and we soaked flax and, you know, you had filtered water and just used, uh, like I said, potato sacks to dry as our dehydrator sheets. And, you know, it, the sun was up for most of the day. So things would dehydrate in, in a day. And um, the, the response from that, we all sat in a circle and the response from it was incredible because most nights they had cooked food. It was vegan, but it was cooked. And people would sit around, you know, smoking weed, playing guitar, you know, singing, you know, just mm. kind of sitting. But after that, that meal that, that we all organized and I, you know, I came up with the menu for it for about a week ahead of time. And after that, people did not know what to do with the energy that they had. They were like running circles around each other. They were doing gymnastics, like singing. I mean, there was like it, literally people just could not contain themselves. They were like, you know, run, just it was, there. No one could sit down. It was like the energy that got unlocked from that meal was so energizing. And from from then on, I realized, okay, <laughs> my little experiment with a group of random people totally worked. Uh, raw foods is, and living foods is this lifestyle. So from then on, I've always sought community. But my goal in life right now is to recreate that moment over and over of feeding living foods to people and watching them open up and and get energy uh -huh. that they never knew they had before. Yeah. That's the that's the, all, that's all, always all of that's amazing everything you just said there is like blowing my mind let's pick that apart <laughs> because there's so much we'll get back to the costa rica that's unbelievable but mm -hmm. juliano's raw right it's it's i would say that um i guess there's, there's kind of a perception in my mind that 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 maybe at one time or maybe even still now that that was kind of the center of the whole raw food movement was california and those restaurants mm -hmm. and He's like a kind of interesting figure, like maybe seems a little bit of, has a bit of an ego maybe or, mm -hmm. or something. Um, but obviously being successful with, with what he's done and, and everything. Um, what was that scene like, you know, in, in California? Was, was that, was David Wolf around there and different people like oh, yeah. that? Or who, was that all, what was happening there? Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Jobs came by, David Wolf uh, came to the restaurant all the time. Um, and that spawned a number of restaurants. Um, in fact, uh, I mean, let me just preface this. I love Giuliano until the day I, 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 I die. He's a fantastic guy. I saw him at Burning Man a few years ago. Anytime I see him, it's just, whoa, it just takes me back to those times. But it was, as you said, the center of the raw food movement. Giuliano was a rock star. And that's, you know, he um, he was the the modern guru of, of raw foods. People had never tasted food like this before. Sometimes we would have to close down the restaurant because we had a celebrity there that just was going to get paparazzi. And um, so let's see. Um, it, <laughs> I, I'm trying to remember some of the celebrities that I saw there. Um, the, and the names are escaping me. I'll, I'll come back to them. But every once in a while, we, like, we'd have to just be really quiet and make sure we didn't point because we'd say, oh, hey, there's, uh, you know, there's, you know, the, the mom from Family Ties is sitting over there and we right, look over, right. oh, wow, looks really good. You know, or, um, uh, oh, uh, yeah, the, the name, I'm like blanking act, on the name. Act, actors, actresses, rock stars, stuff like that. It was the place to be. Yeah, that's what yeah. Giuliano's was, was the place to be seen. And the more expensive it was, the more attractive it was to that, to that group. And so we get all kinds of people coming down from Malibu to, to have dinners there. And um, from then on, then it was just this wild parties. And I remember going to avocado parties, durian parties. Um, there was a chef, his name was Rashid, who made, of all things, raw vegan chili dogs. And he hosted <laughs> giant parties. Just He would turn out a hundred of these things. I still don't know how he made them. I think it was jackfruit. 
Um, and we had uh, <laughs> Dr. David Jubbs showed up, to, uh, uh, at, um, David Avocado Wolf would show up and, and there'd be barrels of avocados and people would just party with the avocados and you know, massage uh, circles would pop up and people would start doing iridology readings and you know, just stay up all night. And uh, you know, it was just incredible the, the amount of energy that, that went into uh, hosting these parties that could have been alcohol parties, right? Or they could have right. been like drug full parties, but there was completely sober. Everyone was just celebrating food and people were publishing books. Um, Roxanne's was another one that popped up that was in San Francisco. Uh, a very high-end uh, gourmet restaurant, um, one that's still around Que Sera, Sera which is in Berlin game. Uh, I go there every once in a while. Just, um, and then all the people that worked at his restaurant are now raw food chefs, dessert chefs. I think Seed Cuisine got spawned from that movement. And as we left the restaurant that we all either started our own restaurants or started teaching, um, Giuliano's went on to rename his restaurant to Planet Raw. And the uh, last thing I checked, he's still in Malibu. He, he, is writing scripts, movie scripts, maybe, and I think serving collard wraps on the beach. And um, so that was the first time I'd seen a, a celebrity chef. And yeah. it's really easy to get into that, you know, get caught up in that. And I, I think, and that's a different path than I think some <clears throat> some of my friends have taken. And, you know, I've eaten at raw food restaurants all, all over the West Coast and all around the world. And I think really the movement where it's at right now is, is a humble offering, is to say, this food is, is, something that you've never tasted before just eat it and and yeah. see what you think there's no philosophy associated with it there's no wild lifestyle associated with it. it's just does it make you feel better then incorporate it into your lifestyle and that will crack people open and that's really i think where the future of the movement is that first initial craze in la and it's still there there's i mean wild living foods in la is amazing uh, peace pies raw in san diego i mean they're still doing that you can go there and you can have a really big party there's i mean you could just bring all your friends and you know, just yeah. taste the cuisines of the world. Um, but I hope that answers your question. I mean, I, I just great. have fond memories, but it was, I don't think it was sustainable. I think it was more like we all had to kind of settle in and find our own groove. And where I found my groove is just, I just love serving food to people and then yeah. if, the reaction to it, you know? It feels like there was almost like a, a like a chemical reaction or explosion of all these <laughs> different, different characters that came together. And people get excited by raw foods and by the, the raw living foods lifestyle. And I mm -hmm. think that, you know, that initial excitement, all that energy, eventually they have to work out, well, what am I going to do with this? You know, and <laughs> it, it turns into like, maybe they go down, uh, you know, um, they start to sell products, they start to do other things and it becomes a more of a corporate, I don't know, like, but I guess that like, obviously with David Wolf and people, he went into selling superfoods and different things like that and chocolate and everything else and um other people aren't aren't really in the raw food movement anymore i suppose um but that's all i love to hear about that that's, that's really cool uh and you you lived in a, you lived in this place called rawtopia uh yeah so rawtopia was um kind of a it was a sanctuary up in malibu we it was actually an old just a big uh, old horse ranch that we started building little projects like solar uh, little solar dehydrators and building uh, like little caves and trying to incorporate a modern lifestyle like the internet and computers because uh, I'm a software engineer by design so I, I you know I, I still use computers all the time I use them every day but how do you counteract that and how do you incorporate the modern world of being in the internet into this pl place and that's what Rocktopia was about it was financed by um, a couple of people that were, you know, they had enough money and they were retired and, you know, had all their investments, but really wanted to change the world. And uh, so the, um, I think it became uh, more of a haven for people to freeload. And that's what really was the downfall of that right. is people would just show up and not contribute. And that's not really the intention of the, of communities like that. So um, in fact, I, I just spoke today with uh, someone who lives in Bali, um, and I think that's where things are popping up now is uh, those type of communities still exist all over the place. Um, you'll find that in Hawaii. I have some land in Big Island, Hawaii, and where you know you can go wildcraft food, and there's a raw vegan movement there, as you see on Instagram, and Bali, and of course, um, uh, Thailand, you know, Kohangan Island. I think there's uh, someone that I follow, Rob List 95. Amazing lifestyle. He just eats fruit, and he's a fruit blogger, you know, right? And he I don't know what he does for work, but he doesn't need a lot of money to do that. And I yeah, think that's yeah. the future of the movement. So Rawtopia was more of a, let's, you know, let's, uh, we all have money. 
let's see what we can do with it. And that brought people in that didn't have money and, and just wanted to, you know, sit around and, and not contribute. So I think it's more, the future of the movement is more, can you live a, low, a self-sustainable lifestyle while still incorporating technology in the modern world into that lifestyle yeah. while still earning a living? I do feel like that's the danger of communities and people have people definitely have a great desire to live in community and especially when people come to the festival and they, they, they come for a week and they feel they've never really lived in community properly before and mm -hmm. they're so supported they they're so um fulfilled in so many ways they've got so many people to talk to and meet and so great so many great experiences they really develop over the course of seven or eight days and they, then they think i'd like to be in this all the time and and there, I, I don't really, I know there's a few places out there, but I don't really, I've never been to a lot of them. So I can't vouch for like, you should go to this place. And, and probably as many times I've heard bad stories as good stories about places that have tried to do that. And uh, I, I can imagine that happening where people are coming along and not really contributing and helping out and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful idea. And the Costa Rica thing you're talking about. So this was, a, did you say it was a three month gathering in the jungle? Yes, yes. It was a World Rainbow Gathering. The people just did not want to leave, so it went on for three months. <laughs> <laughs> and how? But how did you, how did they like finance, like like bring all the food into the jungle and all that stuff in the kitchen? Like how did that? Did everyone well, we, just contribute? Or? Yeah, yeah. We so I um, I led a, a group of people or inspired a group of people to go and start. You know, Costa Rica. You can travel that bus really easily. Very scary experience. I mean, if you were ever on a Costa Rican bus traveling through the mountains, just close your eyes because. It's not how they drive anywhere else in the world. But um, what we would do is we go to the farmers markets and Costa Rica is, you know, it literally means rich, rich coast or rich land. And the, um, the amount of fruit there that's available for so cheap. Uh, I'm used to paying here in California, we pay two to four dollars for avocado in Hawaii. I pay a dollar per avocado at the time in Costa Rica. If you were a Costa Rican native, you could get the avocados for a nickel, the equivalent of a nickel. But if you didn't speak Spanish and were American, or from some, or from Europe, uh, the price shot up to a quarter, right? Which was <laughs> uh, just price for an avocado. But we were like, oh, I'll take twenty of them, you know, just give them to me. So what we would do is pair people up with um, locals uh, from Costa Rica who were interested in going to the gathering, Spanish, native Spanish speakers, and make sure that they could, you know, know where to go. And but we would then send these like human caravans back where someone would leave a bag of lentils or, or a case of pineapple in a certain place in a certain city. And then we used email to communicate. We had a mailing list also and say, hey, anyone that's going to the Rainbow Gathering, stop by the city. There's a bag of lentils here. Pick it up and take it with you. And oh, it was wow. a really <laughs> neat thing where we had scouts going around and some people would go volunteer on local farms. Um, and then we also started to involve the community because Costa Rica is um, a devoutly religious uh, area and people did not like what they rumored to have heard there, like people dancing around the fires and, you know, clothing optional. This is not what yeah. is normal Costa Rican lifestyle. There's a very cons somewhat conservative lifestyle. So there was actually a day where we opened up the whole festival advertised in the paper and tried to put a positive spin on it that said, Hey, come, come on, check us out. <laughs> and it was actually really funny because people brought bananas, which was really a sweet gesture, but was also, I mean, it, it was interpreted by some people as do they like that's what you would do if you see monkeys in a zoo right <laughs> you, bring, <laughs> you eat the monkeys in it but but we got past that what happened is even some people from the local community state and it became this like beautiful thing where it we didn't need a lot of money everyone contributed in their own way and uh what we did is we started a sprout farm so we took some of the lentils and um some of the other like beans and uh vegetables and things and we started a little garden and that way we didn't have to keep going out, you know, we could sustain and, and eat um, salads and things from the garden, you know, in the jungle, anything grows, you could grow, plant a golf ball and you'll get a golf ball tree. I mean, it's yeah. just so abundant. And then we would have people go out and volunteer on farms nearby and bring back bales, you know, uh, bins of strawberries, um, you know, anything that we could find. And of course, you can always just walk out and pick, I mean, the papayas, uh, chickens plant papayas. So they'll eat the papaya seeds, they'll walk down the road, poop, and next thing you know, is just as you're traveling by bus, you can, at any bus stop, you can walk out and there's a red papaya right there. So um, Costa Rica was really conducive yeah. to having a sustainable community. And as long as you were willing to just put something into it, and I think that's what I find is the, the basic rule of those type of communities is um, you get out of it what you put into it. 
So if your intention is to walk into community and siphon off the community, that's what you're going to get out of it is, is that siphon is eventually going to dry up unless you put something back into it. So people were looking for things to do. In fact, part of what happened is it was, the lifestyle was so popular that a local um, horse uh, merchant came in and brought a bunch of what we thought were tame horses turned out to be a bunch of wild unbroken horses. And it was quite an entertaining thing to watch these um, uh for lack of a better word, hippies, <laughs> try to tame these horses. They thought, oh, I'll just hop up on top of the horse. Well, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> the, horse, the horse has to want you on his back. So we would just sit there all day and watch people try to get on these horses and watch the horse just buck them off or run away and try to knock them off of the branch. But what would happen is people would bond with a certain horse. The horse was like the equivalent of $40, right? It was incredible. Like the, the um, you know, the economy there was really sustainable. So you could walk in to Costa Rica with $200, and, and live there for months at a time, especially with the support of that community. And what happened is this horse caravan then emerged from that rainbow gathering, which went on for years. And as far as I know, it still went on. And what it was is you put $40 in for a horse. There was another gentleman that came in, made you a pair of custom uh, shoes that were like, you know, split toe shoes, uh -huh. built you a custom saddle. Um, and then what you would do is go in and put another $10 in on a pack horse. And there was a group of four people and five horses and the middle horse would carry the pack and they would rotate in and out. And then you would just pick a horse and try to bond with it. And so people would bond with their horses. And then that caravan went all over Central America and up to California. And it was this really neat thing because they blogged the whole time. And when people wanted to leave the caravan, then they would post, Hey, my horse is up for grabs. It's in this area, send me $40 and you can take the horse off. And then you would catch up with another caravan that came through and it became this traveling modern day, gypsy lifestyle that would do circuses at local towns to make money. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talent like fire dancing and, um, you know, gymnastics and, you know, just anything you could think of acro yoga. Uh, and that's how they made their money is they would just travel from here to there and, and do wild crafting. And, and that's what was born out of the movement. I really wish I could have joined, but um, I had other things, you know, other, you know, I missed my family and things, but um, it, you know, that, that's what came out of that community in Costa Rica. It was really no one wanted to leave. And so they kept going for quite a while. That's amazing, yeah. That's an incredible story. Um, and so at that point, you, it seems like, and and you, you'd been at Giuliano's, you'd been at this thing. Is that when you sort of committed to being basically like a raw vegan chef, as a as as part of your uh, purpose or occupation or like you you moved, that's what I'm trying to work. It is a word. Did you go, did you continue to work in restaurants from there or do something else or what was it? Yes. Yeah. So what I did is I, I had two goals in life. One was to retire early and um, the other, and, you know, just be a raw vegan chef, do lectures, uh, share food with people and just continue to spread what I've learned, what Victoria's inspired in me and what I've carried with me all these years is that the return to Eden, that's what I really like to see the world go to. Um, and so I've always done rough food, chefing as a, a side gig and it's my passion I, I i mean you can tell i just light up if you ask me about you know javascript or html yeah sure i'm interested in that and that's what i went to school for but um but i, I always make sure i have something going on and so i hooked up with the krishna kitchen uh world famous um you know kitchen that just gives out free food to people and at festivals they sell it for minimum cost and um there was a gentleman his name is nitai um and i you know member of the Hare Krishna movement here in the US. Um, and what he did is he would roll out the red carpet for me and allowed me to just do my thing. And he, uh, the, the Krishnas would, he would drop in on a certain place like Burning Man or Harmony Festival, Raw Spirit Festival, uh, um, Symbiosis, Beloved, any of those uh, festivals, he would pay the entrance fee with donations from the Krishna kitchen. And what they would do is they would uh, make prasad, which is their form of uh, spirituality. They they don't do much evangelizing. Like a, they're not so much like a Christian movement in that way. What they do is they feed people and they improve the world by feeding people blessed food. And they invited me to be part of the kitchen, which I did for many years. And so my food was always there was always some of it that was offered to Krishna, uh, blessed, and it was set aside in the kitchen. We would uh, have strict health uh, guidelines in the kitchen. We would play um, you know, meditative music. Uh, you know, there was certain rules about how, you know, it's even rules like if you'd gone to the bathroom in the last two hours, uh, you couldn't come back in the kitchen for several hours, you know, things like that. And uh, just very, very strict rules to make pe sure people didn't get sick and make sure the food remained blessed. 
And I did that for many years. Um, Nitai passed away a few years ago. I actually learned of his death. And so I haven't participated with the Krishna Kitchen since then. So what I've done instead is I, I do pop up uh, restaurants at festivals. Um, I have all my festival gear, you know, I'll, I'll pay the entrance fee and to serve raw food and usually pair up with a friend of mine. I've done that in, um, you know, in Oregon and uh, California and Arizona. Um, and so what I do now is I'll usually go to a raw food restaurant like Que Sera Sera in Burlingame, or I'll go to uh, a co-op like Ukiah has a really nice food co-op where they have a teaching kitchen. And I'll gather some interest with, in it and I'll offer like a $5, you know, come come learn how to make raw vegan tacos. And that's where I've been at for quite a while now because what I felt is the raw vegan movement has always been, has been a fad. And veganism is really where people are moving to now. And I was kind of waiting until veganism became more popular. And I think 2020, 2019 was the year is that veganism no longer became this word about, you know, skinny guy with dreadlocks, right? Who, who doesn't <laughs> work, right? Now it's you know, celebrities and, and movie stars and, and rock stars and, and you know, musicians and just normal people everywhere, you know, and they're uh, benefiting from the lifestyle. And I think now I've moved more towards social media um, and uh, worked on Instagram. And what I'm really doing right now is I concentrate on my eBooks. So I have three so far. You mentioned Living Foods for Everyone. That's my first series. This is my series for the world, right? Is I don't care what lifestyle you're living. You can try, I made raw vegan turkey. I mean, I, what a silly concept, but <laughs> I was inspired and I thought, I, hey, why don't I try it? So I made a, I felt so silly, Ronnie. I just felt so silly making this raw vegan turkey. I made a little turkey body and made little legs and wings and just I just laughed the whole time I was making it. But that's been one of my best selling books because here's here's the problem is you go to your parents' house, even as a vegetarian or vegan or even gluten free or anything, dairy free, and you, the rules just go right out the window because you're with familiar people. They worry about you, you know, they're they're not quite sure what to make of this new lifestyle that you're adopting, no matter where you are on the journey. So this book, this series that I'm working on right now, which is gonna be a series, probably about 10 books, they're just, you know, I I'm going to do uh, like a Mediterranean book and a, a English pub book an American bar book, you know, late night, late night fried food, you know, onion rings and jalapeno poppers and all this stuff. That's what you can bring to the party, right? When you, no matter who you're with, you bring some raw vegan uh, jalapeno poppers. I don't care who you are. Those things are gone. You know, you make some cheese and I've had that experience before where I can connect with people through that food without it being weird. Right. Um, so that's where I'm at right now. I'm developing recipes. In fact, after we get off the podcast here, I'm going to, I'm working on a raw vegan omelet recipe of nice. all things yeah, yeah. and black, black salt to, um, to make it taste like egg. And uh, so I'm doing high end plating. That's more of my focus now. So what you'll see for me uh, soon is I'm going to focus more toward the rest of my journey, right? Is what happens if you let go of oil? What happens if you let go of salt? What happens if you let go of, um, of heavier foods, lots of nuts? That's what Giuliano's is about. And that's what, I consider the raw food movement really dragged down by the, the huge amount of nuts that are in every recipe. So my next series is going to concentrate more on lighter foods, um, living foods uh, for um, people who want to use more sprouts, for instance, and garbanzo beans can be a great substitute for nuts. And then from then on, working with exposing people to the philosophy of, of living foods lifestyle, how do you incorporate nature into your life? right? Mm. We're so isolated from nature, but fruit is right there. Fruit is nature. Fruit is that contract that I talked about with the tree. You eat the fruit, you spread the seeds, everybody's happy, right? The tree's happy, you're happy, you're fed. So, um, so look for more of that for me. Uh, yes. As far as starting a restaurant, um, I'd like to consult with restaurants. I think that's really my niche is these mm. restaurants that are now wondering, how do I cater to vegans? How do I cater to raw vegans? Yeah. Um, starting a training program with those chefs and working directly with the chefs no matter where you're at, whether you're a Michelin star restaurant or whether you're, you're a, um, a street food restaurant is offering something, right? Awesome. And I gotta be honest with you, Rodney, this is for selfish reasons. Cause I want to, when I travel the world, I want to be able to eat everywhere. If I can show people how to make food that <laughs> I want to eat, <laughs> it's going to be easier to travel. <laughs> so, so let me ask you, what, what would a typical day be for you on your diet? How, how do you eat just for yourself? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. So uh, it changes all the time. And so what I've gotten into now is how can I exclude nuts and how can I cut down on the amount of seeds that I'm eating? Um, because they're readily available. They're fairly cheap where I live. But speaking with people in Bali uh, this morning, I learned that nuts, macadamia nuts, you can't just go to the grocery store and get them. Brazil nuts. 
So a uh, typical day for me will be I'll wake up and of course I wake up. Everyone always says that. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll do a juice. Uh, first thing is uh, grapefruit, lemon, orange juice. Um, sometimes I'll get a uh, juice of pineapple, but just some sort of citrus juice. And I find that really kind of you know, gets me started. First thing uh, gets my bowels moving. Um, sometimes I'll do like a, a dandelion root tea uh, first thing in the morning and um, beyond that, I, I just usually take it real easy in the mornings. Um, and that's my time for stretching because I found if I eat before I stretch, it's a little harder and I get a little bit more tightness. So I like to get my legs all stretched and my arms stretched, do my, uh, you know, my hot keto exercises, my Taekwondo exercises. Uh, if I'm going to go running that day, then I'll go run. Um, I'm working on my half marathon and, um, well, actually I've done a few half marathons working on my marathon now and I can run much better if, if I don't have, you know, food in my stomach. Um, and so Grant Campbell, I think is, he's the long distance runner. I think I met yeah, him. Sure. The guy, he just eats celery when he runs. He runs hundred miles at a time and eats celery. Like, okay, I, I, you know, I, I can do, I can, you know, that's my inspiration is, is listening to him talk at the last festival. Uh, for lunch, usually cucumber, avocado, tomato salad. Again, again, these are all fruits. Um, no oil, no salt, completely cut those out of my diet. Um, I'll do, um, you know, minimal uh, spices like cumin is a nice warming spice. In the winter, I'll go to kale salad because believe it or not, kale is a warming food. When kale digests, it actually produces heat. And that's how I lived in the snow in the wintertime uh, in, as, as a living foods, um, uh, living foodist is I ate ginger, jalapeno, Anaheim pepper, um, garlic, onion, kale, uh, you know, yams, you can eat yams raw and I make a great sweet potato pie um, with yams if you puree them. Uh, also the juices, when you digest them, they produce heat and that's a heat source inside your body. Whereas if you tr eat something warm, your body actually does the opposite and cools it down. Mm. So it's a little colder here. I go skiing a few times a week and then uh, usually for dinner, I'll try something a little bit more gourmet. Um, I've, let's see, what have I eaten recently? Uh, I've been doing, well, I've been making my, my recipes. So I've been making like zucchini bacon and sausage out of sunflower seeds and things like that. I usually eat something a little heavier for dinner. Sometimes I'll skip dinner, but my favorite thing right now is sun-dried tomatoes. I don't know why, but wintertime is like, I have all these tomatoes that are, um, they're salt-free and I'll just soak them in water and I'll sit down with a bowl of tomatoes and eat it. Right. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I just love tomatoes, uh, yeah, cucumbers, yeah. um, just eating Persian cucumbers on their own. Um, just that really simple lifestyle. Um, I make nice. coconut wraps sometimes and I'll put some salad inside the coconut wraps with a couple um, different vegetables like bell pepper. Uh, you know, I love arugula, so I'm eating that right now. Uh, it really varies, but I find that, you know, eating that the lighter thing and cutting out the nuts and seeds is really the more sustainable way to go. Mm. Um, and then the evening, lots, of, you know, I'll eat dried fruit and then of course fruit all day, just fruit all day. Bananas, um, we get uh, persimmons, it's kind of the end of persimmon season, I'll eat six, eight persimmons a day. Um, mm. apples, um, you know, oranges, blood oranges are one of my favorite things right now. Uh, I'll eat an avocado. That'll be my whole meal. You know, amazing. So, amazing. Yeah, it varies every day, but it's getting much lighter. And I, you know, I've been for, I accidentally became fruitarian recently. Um, nice. so I didn't realize I was fruitarian, but I did some research and I, I discovered that fruitarianism is eating anything that starts off as a flower. Right. And so <laughs> that includes, uh, beans like lentils, Garbanzo beans, peas, those all start off as flowers. Sunflower seeds, they start off as a flower, right? Uh, nuts are a form of flowers. Um, and then, of course, you know, sapotes and things like that. Those are all, you know, staples. But uh, that's what I've learned is the fruitarian lifestyle doesn't just mean eating sweet fruits all the time. All the non-sweet fruits, all, you know, tomato, bell pepper, avocado, cucumber. Um, and then, of course, of course, incorporating some greens um, into that as well. So, uh, that's the center of my lifestyle. I'd say just really simple greens and non-sweet fruits. And then also the sweet fruits until I, you know, there's a certain point at which I say, okay, enough sweet stuff. Um, and then I'll leave you off with one of my favorite snacks. One bite of Brazil, one Brazil nut, a bite of banana, a Brazil nut, I bite a banana, Brazil nut, bite a banana. Until the <laughs> Super cool. Um, I've really enjoyed speaking to you today, Ocean. And uh, I, th I imagine there's so much more to your story. I think that I know you've got a lot of books coming out. But if you wrote, put your story together into a book, I think people would love that as well. It's, um, it's so fascinating what, you, what you've been telling me today. Um, so let, let me say, uh, how would, what advice would you give for people that are beginning, that are starting out on this lifestyle? What's, what's your guidance for them? 
Ah, uh, okay. My guidance. Uh, okay, so there's a couple things. The first is um, to just eat more fruit. I mean, that's really it cracks you open. Mm. Just get more fruit in you. Whenever you're hungry, there's a there was a blog called Go Eat an Apple when I first started out. That should be your go-to food. Anytime you think you're hungry, go eat an apple. Um, sometimes water is what you really want. Yeah. You know, it's not food that you want. It's water. There's so many ways that you can feel dehydrated but think you're hungry. Yes. So eat an apple, drink some water. Eat an apple, drink some water. Go stretch. Um, if you're feeling stressed, spend time outside. All those things are far better teachers than any book, any anything that you can watch, anything that you can read is your body already knows how to feed itself. All you've got to do is let that body have a voice. And that's how you get it. You eat fruit, exercise, spend time in nature, meditate, and be around like-minded people who are also on that healing journey. Um, let go of those relationships that no longer serve you. Find another way to connect with people. If you're out drinking beer all the time and, and you feel an urge to stop doing that, connect those people in a different way, right? Um, play, play games. I mean, it's just life is to be enjoyed. If you, if you feel yourself overwhelmed, understand that nature has your back. At any moment, you can buy a $200 plane ticket to go to Hawaii, to go to Bali, to go to, in, to Thailand. You can go there and live a lifestyle that's so much simpler than what you have now. Keep that in your back pocket. Make that your goal. Visit those places. Understand that the lifestyle that we're living right now um, is not uh, sustainable. The sustainable one is symbiosis with nature. And that's my advice for people is, is just connect with nature in, a, in as real of a way as possible. And you will end up writing books. You end up making your own food. I mean, where that journey takes, you just gets driven by the connection between yourself and nature. You're a unique individual. Nature wants you to connect with it. Go do that. And that will, that will show you the way. And that's really the best advice I can give you is, is trust yourself and, and make sure that you connect with trees and animals and, and the earth on a daily basis. And that will transform you in a way that nothing else can. That's amazing. So Ocean, where, where can people find out more about you and follow you maybe? And what, how can you help them? Yeah, so I have, I have a website, rawvegan.love, and I'll be doing a redesign pretty soon. You can get a few ebooks there. You can contact me. I love talking with people, hearing from them. And you can follow me on Instagram. It's at rawvegan.love. I post recipes there. Feel free to DM me. Um, I, just, I just love talking with people and answering questions. Um, and, you know, if you want me to host a, a demo uh, or want me to visit, you know, when COVID's over, then that's what I'll do. And maybe I'll be nearby and, and we can, um, we can do a, a raw recipe demo, but that's the best place to get a hold of me is uh, through my website, rawvegan.love or DM me on Instagram. Well, thank you so much for joining us today with the, oh, my um, pleasure. the, the Love Fruit podcast. Just to remind everyone, if you want to stay in touch with us, you can go to fruitfest.co.uk uh, stay sub and, and subscribe to our newsletter there if you like and follow us online as well. Um, just to finish us off, Ocean, what, what's your last words of wisdom for, for the audience? Uh, my last words of wisdom, let's see. Uh, life is beautiful and it never stops being beautiful if you open up to it. Oh my God, that's amazing. Uh, this has been, honestly, this has been one of my favorite interviews and I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. And I, I hope we can do this again sometime. Yes, of course, Ronnie, anytime. Thank you.